with the vendors. Um, the vendors are going around emptying them, cleaning them up, and that's how they man manage to maintain. Um, I <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to get us in the mood of is what's the solution? And we all know, and we've all discussed it, the solution is for a place for people to go, and it's housing. So one of the things, through COVID, I have worked with a nonprofit to pilot what we call a mobile navigation center. We're using motels for that. We're getting people, we're doing that actually, we identified just a handful of the most vulnerable people that were at risk of if dying if they get COVID out of encampments into a motel. When we worked on that and then bring in services and the focus is to really keep an eye on outcomes and how quickly do we actually get people into housing. The goal would be within 90 days or less. We are not there yet in our community. The average length to housing for veterans and they have way more resources than any other population is 175 days right now. So, but what has worked is we're getting people into um, a space, a temporary space, very quickly. Um, we have, uh, we is the Homeless Impact Division, works with partners, we're training what we call housing navigators that are people in the community that professional, um, professionally work with people who experience homelessness. And it's a kind of a standardized way to ID replacement, getting people educated on where the resources are to help people remove barriers to housing. What we found when you work with people in encampments, oftentimes as an outreach worker, you can't find the people. They're not there at that time. Then you have to do multiple trips. Then what they need, you have to go drive somewhere else to get it. You have to care with transportation. Well, if we actually have a temporary place for people to go, different housing navigators come together, they start collaborating, they know where to find the people, People are more accessible, the process is more efficient. So th it's kind of filling a gap in that shelter system. If you remember I said, people in encampments are likely not using the shelter as a, they may go for certain periods, but probably not, they wouldn't be in an encampment if they're actually regular shelter users of the regular system. So we're calling this housing, um, kind of navigation center, a mobile navigation center, because it can be done, in my view, with a small group, anywhere where there's a location. Motels are extremely expensive, that's not sustainable. Right now we had the funds to do that temporarily because of COVID, but um, we just need to think of sustainable measures to help move people to housing as quickly as possible. I had several calls from neighbors not, not too many, but still a few. That's where we got to talking. Um, how can I get involved? What can I do? How can I help? Here's the second piece that I want everybody to be aware of. So band-aids don't work anymore. We all know that. It's just, they don't stick. I say the band-aids, we can try to, it's just not gonna stick. Um, through COVID, um, Nashville is going to be allocated $10 million in emergency solution grants. In a regular year, we get about $450,000 to $500,000. This is $10 million we have never seen. This is an opportunity to really focus on the most vulnerable people, focus on people who are already homeless, and see what we need to do to get them rapidly into housing. Um, these dollars can pay for shelter, these dollars can pay for some prevention dollars. We really need to be careful not focusing too much on prevention except for there are other dollar, other, other grants that can really, that need to focus on prevention. And these are really for people that are already out there, are experiencing homelessness, and help them with rapid rehousing, which uh, will include rent assistance and uh, time-limited um, support services, and then help people, that's where you connect them to employment and all of that. These grants, just one second, <laughs> these grants are gonna go um, and are bid out through, MDHA is receiving those dollars from the federal government, 
and then bids them out to nonprofits. So the first round of these grants is already um, up for bid. The dollars are about to come in. And then for the second round, we're working with MDHA, mayor's office, our office, and the homeless, um, planning Homelessness Planning Council um, to really come up with strategies that really focus on housing. Experience. The difference is you have your own key, you have your privacy, you actually have the ability to breathe and feel safe. You have. One of the big things we found is that the reason that uh, homeless are, are, res are resistant to the shelters is because there's rules that are, they have to comply with. By nature, they, they don't do real well with that, especially the ones that suffer from addiction, which is about 95% of them. So they can't drink, they can't use drugs, they, they have to kind of follow under different guidelines, and they just can't do that. So what happens is when we do actually get them plugged into services, a lot of times when they're in their own place, if they choose to use, they can. But more often than not, the best part about what we try and do and what we've done before when we've cleaned that area, we've cleaned it up three times in the past five years. The people we find down there will get plugged into social services if they haven't been there already. If they have, we find their caseworker, get them going again. The ones that we can, we try and find some kind of rehab for if they're willing to go through it. The ones that uh, are eligible to work, we'll try and get them plugged in quicker. And what it is is it's just where we can kind of bring all of our resources at one point, streamline them, and just for that small group, because it's so hard to do, because it's so intensive as far as resources, and get them all moved into a good place. Either they're on their way towards getting healthy, they're on their way towards employment, they're on their way towards you know, maybe getting back with relatives, whatever it might be. And then there's some out of that group even then that just choose to leave because they don't want to do it. And they're, the a gentleman from the Veterans Affairs said at one time, he goes, there's a reason people choose to live in the woods for 10 years straight. He goes, it's not because they're making rational decisions. So you can't explain rationale to them. And that's why it's so important when we get people moved out that one, you get them plugged into something, but two, it's, the shelters have never really been a good option. But more importantly is that we repurpose the area also because what Jude's saying is if we take those 40 people and put them somewhere and they're doing fantastic and that's amazing that we've changed those lives. There's 40 more people gonna move in tomorrow. And each time that we've cleaned it up, it usually takes about a month to two months to completely repopulate the entire area. The problem is when you start getting into repurposing it, you're talking about a lot of money. And um, the water department's doing a project that's gonna be behind the funeral home. They're gonna pull up a lot of big rock. So hopefully we're gonna be able to coordinate with them to use that rock to put in different areas to make it a little, you don't wanna say uninhabitable, but to kind of redirect. And what we've said is for the parks part, you know you're gonna have homeless in every park no matter what. Every park in the county has homeless and it will. So a better approach that we've started trying to do is section off parts of the park that we know are gonna be used for classrooms, whatever it might be, doing lessons, yoga, whatever, and then just accept the fact that there's gonna be certain parts of the park that if you're not using them, you know you're gonna at some point or another have a homeless population grow there. So work that with physical barriers, with understanding, with outreach, to try and make sure that there's an amiable solution to that. And by, an example I give is, um, the Adventure Science Museum, we had a, a large population down by the railroad tracks, and you start getting into who owns the property. There it was CSX, the parks, and then, so what we did was we actually repurposed part of the open area for classroom space to be used for schools and things like that when they bring kids in. The other part, the Adventure Science spent a lot of a little bit of money, about 30000 I think, on a large, nice chain link fence that divided the property. It was still their property, but it divided, and what we, in working with the homeless said, look, this side of the fence that the parks and the Adventure Science Museum are not planning on using for the next six, seven, eight years, whatever it might be. It's gonna get overgrown, and that's again where you get, start getting into physical barriers using different types of uh, foliage, greenery, bushes, and you kind of say, behind this, no one's gonna worry about it. And that's a nice way of saying, if you're there, 
No one's going to bother you. People are going to be aware of it so they can try and get you resources when you need it. And the flip side is on this other side, you know it's going to be repurposed. Please don't, you know, and the understanding is don't come over here and set up a camp because we're going to ask you to move right away because it's being used on a daily basis. That's worked really well down there. I'm not saying work everywhere, but there are physical limitations you can set up in Brookmead that would limit where the camps are, their access to other areas, and in working, you could change that, but it's going to cost money, and that's what it boils down to. Back to you, Juice, sorry. And then one of the things I want to, um, if you come up here, so one of the things I also want to stress, there are a lot of people, the majority is going and utilizing shelter systems. So it's not, you know, um, any anything against shelters. It's like that that works. We just want to be. I just wanted to bring up a couple additional points um, going off of that. There's a lot of reasons why people do not access shelters that's unrelated to them not being able to be compliant with rules or having substance abuse issues. Um, so for example, sorry, um, there's lots of different reasons why people do not access shelters here in Nashville that are not related to them not being able to comply, um, so to speak, with rules or also unrelated to substance abuse issues. So for example, people may have mental health issues where they do not feel safe or they cannot be um, in environments where they're around literally hundreds of other people. Um, and then also, um, I work with people experiencing homelessness here in Nashville and people's, get, people's belongings get stolen all the time. Um, and then that just is an additional barrier that sets them back significantly. You know, their IDs get stolen and then they're back to square one. Um, so there's lots of different things just outside of substance abuse issues and then just the information that you were bringing up just now, to me in my eyes, these physical barriers, that's just another Band-Aid. And you were saying that we want sustainable solutions. That's not a sustainable solution um, and just not morally, I don't know, salient either with a lot of the people that are working with people experiencing homelessness in the community here. Um, and we know that even if there are certain areas in Nashville where we say, okay, this is fine to have an encampment here for a while, then eventually it's not fine to have an encampment here. And then, you know, we get police brought in there and then we're pushing them around. So it's just this, this musical chairs game where we're pushing them all around the city and frankly, wasting money doing that also. That's why we don't do that anymore. Well, I mean, it may not be your precinct, but we are working with people. We had some encampments that were threatening um, to get closed out also, but then COVID put a pause on that. So on the west side of, or sorry, south side of town here. Yeah, and some of it is on property owner rights and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I, I really want to focus on the housing piece and how to fill the gaps that you pointed out to shelters, which is kind of that concept of where are small places, where are ideal places where we saw that motels can work. And one of the things that I think the motel costs to cut them out is, are there congregations, churches that can we can partner with for situations like that, bringing nonprofits to run it. Um, and then the other thing for neighbors and neighborhood conversations, uh, one of the biggest barriers to housing has been NIMBY, NIMBYism. And NIMBYism, not in my backyard. Just push them to the next council, you know? And it's like, so we need help from neighbors to identify where housing could be possibly that's affordable and then even if you have affordable housing, it needs to be accessible. So the supports once people are going into housing is very, very important. Do you want to come up here too so you can, um, so that people can actually, uh, also the landlord relationships are important, uh, the relationships with people because there's, people have been burnt by so many things that happened to them that there is not the trust issue. So building trust for outreach workers with people that trust them, okay, this time is something is gonna be different. That's what we're working on. But if you don't have anything at the end, then what's the point? It just gets to that. And I think we're already past that point um, because nothing's been done. Apparently the other community has been closed. I don't even like the fact that it's called an encampment. Um, this is something that even me in the beginning, you know, I'm a very giving person. I'd say most people here are. Uh, we've tried to give them things. They supposedly created a mafia system where they're not even safe in there themselves. Um, it needs to be almost shut down. Based on what you're telling me, I, I feel like I, I want to say well, it needs to be shut down immediately. There are people getting death threats, the businesses around there. There are people getting um, rape, stabbing. There's dead bodies that have been supposedly dumped in the river there. Um, 
That's horrifying. Um, the sanitary putting toilets there was not good for the community. It's just encouraging, you know, the people, you tried to drive in that parking lot this morning and it was so scary you can't get in there. It shouldn't be that way for the residents either. And so you may be trying to work on housing, but I have long list of comments from people from the area businesses. This meeting happened too fast and maybe you're not the correct person. If you're working on housing, we're probably gonna be opposed it's not that people don't want to do that, but it's like you guys have waited too long and you push people to West Nashville. And that's what we are, you know, this, these people have been there a long time. They're very mean. They're defacing businesses. There's break-ins. Uh, the amount of crime, we would like crime statistics in that area. We can't continue to wait this out because people are being hurt. Um, it's escalating. Now they're in the back of another parking lot where you can't, some person tried to walk. I watched a man try to walk yesterday and all he was trying to do is get to his RV in the Walmart parking lot, which is what Walmart promotes. And he, I sit there and watched him because I really felt like he was very unsafe. He couldn't walk through the middle of those people. And then I watched two other people walk into the park this morning and I waited for them to come out because I'm, I was concerned about them. Um, this is not something that it's, you know, 90 days, whatever, you know, it's like promise after promise, but I don't think that's where the funding should, should be directed. If you're, a, you know, a resident of that area, we've got to protect that community first. These people are, are not, they're not nice. I got threatened because I asked them not to dump trash on the ground. They just pulled out of their parking lot and they dumped it. And then I witnessed some things going on this morning that actually feel- I'm, Not to interrupt you, but did you call the police when that happened? Uh, when, which one? Any of them. Because here's no, the reason, we don't have calls for service that show up. No, and that's what, and that's what, yes. Um, there have been yesterday, I don't think I necessarily always have to because the fire happened yesterday or day before. That's like the second or third one. Apparently there's a mafia in the area. Well, see, we all know it in the area. There's supposedly this, this hierarchy in, within the camp and there was a fire Supposedly yesterday, Walmart, or not Walmart, uh, Lowe's called. Uh, Lowe's told me they called because the fire is so big. Well, this is a threat to our utilities, too. This is right under the utility line. First of all, that's not safe for the people anyway. They need to be removed immediately. There's a, there are risk management departments. There are risk management departments that would not go along with this either. This is not like a safe thing, especially during COVID. But if you guys want us, you know, to feel like that uh, we are wasting value, that was part of our points too. There's a, there's a long, long list of things, but the fact that we would have to risk public resources on that and understand you, what you're thinking with barricades and that sort of thing, that that would be a good thing. And I agree with that and to repurpose the area. It's just that it's gotten so dangerous. That's why we're all starting to say, okay, it's gone on too long, too far, too fast. And now, you know, we've all been kind to them. We've tried to be good, but I think, you know, Walmart was giving us some experiences that they've had and, you know, the other area businesses. Um, it's, it's too, um, we can't wait that long. Something really bad's gonna happen. Now they're up in Jim and Nick's in that area. They have taken over their parking lot and they had to file a notice for an eviction notice or whatever. They filed that and yes, they called the police. So um, I would like the statistics actually on, yes, who gets the calls and why are we having to reset, you know, they're burning down each other's tents and threatening each other within the camp and you're having resources that are having to be pulled from other parts of the city that actually need that, you know, those resources. Yes, go ahead. First, um, officers, are there, have you do have reports of a bunch of dead bodies back there in the river? To be quite frank, man, what happens a lot of times is there's more attention put on social media about instances and uh, incidents than we ever receive a call volume. We pull the call mm -hmm. volume before we come up here. Good. Very few calls related to that. And more often than not, it's just general calls for extra patrol. We don't get the rapes. Has there been some crimes happen? Absolutely. And we address that when it comes up, but people don't call. They put everything on social media but that's not a response for the police to respond to. And that's the problem is we start getting one or two things and then it, it, we all know how social media works. It just goes on untold and unstopped. But the real issue is that we don't have people calling the police when they need to. I personally know that they have been. And I'll tell you one instance. One was like they in the strip mall, they came over and I, I witnessed all of these things and the police were called. Um, 
One was a man who just decided he was going to go 60 miles an hour into the strip mall and end up in dead end into the thing. That was probably what six eight months ago, and witnessed that. You know the the um, well actually I didn't witness it. I was I heard it happen threw a green dumpster over his car and rammed into that. And the needles were found later just all laying out on the, on the road right there. Then I witnessed somebody with a gun, uh, or they said they had a gun, and they were threatening the person at Wingstop, and they were screaming and yelling, and the business owners let, were coming out saying, please stop. Let me, let yeah, me, it wasn't let, me, but other people witnessed Let, let me just suggest uh, for a second, yeah. your, all your points are really well taken, and I think that's why we're here. So I really appreciate you coming. Part of our goal, I think, talking to Judy and, and the other council people is to brainstorm solutions so we mm -hmm. can address exactly what you're talking about. So if we, we know there's huge issues yeah. and we would like to get input from the, the police, but I think right. we our, our goal is to start coming up with some ideas. Well, and we ha I have a long list of possible solutions, you know, fencing, closing it off, doing uh, pass cards, doing doing something to keep those folks out of there, but, but continuing to let them live there when other communities have moved them out. I mean, if we need petitions, we need whatever to go ahead and stop it now, then we need to stop it now. They can go to another part of the city. They've already been disrespectful and they've been dangerous for us. Um, a normal person, I would love for you guys to go down there and think that you can walk safely through the park. You cannot. And neither can a person with a child. And and the fact that, you you know, they're walking around with a fifth of whiskey at 7 in the morning, and, you know, you're, you're thinking, there's no way I'm even getting out of my car. You turn around and you leave. That, is, to, that is not a housing issue, and so maybe that is not your department. Maybe that is another risk management. Maybe that is another department that we need to work on to... Uh, do something about that it's it's gone too far it's not you know like we can just wait to find these people housing you know you should have done that like when the other communities were moving around and there was something else happening we have so. uh, nashville has in general a a homeless issue Ho housing is not affordable and it's just difficult to live in this city and more and more people are becoming homeless because we don't have enough supply to keep up with the demand and you see what housing costs are and there's nothing we can, these folks are humans who are gonna have to live somewhere, and if you push them out of there, they're gonna be somewhere new. Well, you can't just close everything off and solve the problem. There's no easy solution to this. Well, th this is right, but it's moved to our area of town where we're not safe, and we're not saying, we're very giving people. We understand the homeless situation, but these are career homeless. These are not, these are people that need, they do need help. They need mental help. They need, you know, drug addiction help. They're alcohol, drugs, whatever. They do need help, but we are not, as a community, we are not uh, capable of providing that for them. All we want to know is during COVID and when everybody else is trying, stressing being homeless or they're, they need this part to be able to, you know, go to, to, you know, relieve themselves and just, you know, have a peace of mind to be able to, they should have the freedom to be able to go there and feel we safe. We need to, we need okay. to move on. We need to move on a little bit. And one of the things. Yeah. Go ahead, Commander. Hello, I'm David Corman, West Precinct Commander. So, Brookmead uh, Park is in my precinct. And I think we need to, number one thing is every time you see something that you think is a crime, you need to report it, call 862-8600. We may or may not come out there, but it's documented that there was a call for service. Then allows the park police captain and myself to figure out where we need to put resources. Next thing I want to say before I say the rest, homelessness is not a crime. These are people. These are people just like you and me. Now, I may not agree with walking around in a parking lot with a fifth of whiskey at 7 in the morning. I mean, I, I just, you know, I, I don't function like that, but that doesn't mean that's not their norm. And there's something if adversely affecting them to live their lives in this manner. So, all of our council members in this area are here. You have their voice. How many employees do you have? Uh, with direct services, two. Two people to address this problem. That's ridiculous. That is absolutely, they're here, they know what needs to be done, let's push, this, let's push it so she gets more people. That's what needs to be done. Number two, I agree with David over here, we, we can't just remove this group of people because they're gonna go somewhere else. Who knows, it might be in your backyard literally this time. We have to do something to provide them the services and the locations that they need. All right, so again, I will tell you that yes, it's, the crime is rising inside the park. It's, and I hate to use this term, but it would be a homeless resident on a homeless resident has increased by 
by 61 and a half percent. I've been tracking the numbers since the beginning of the year. So it's probably related to the COVID and the situation that they can't get the services they can't. Let's say they, let's say they split some money on the side of the road. Well, we all know traffic's down stream. So there goes their revenue. We all know that burglaries are on the rise. We did have a little stint of burglaries, commercial burglaries, where they were homeless related. That's where the suspects were, but they weren't the ones that reside out here. They were somewhere else. So there's a lot of things we need to think about. And I understand, you're, and you probably have some frustration too, but yours, but we all pretty much know what the problems are, but we can't that. document those if we don't know what they are. But I think the, the meeting here is to find a solution. And it's gonna take some time. Because also like a good word she said, it's sustainability. There's another term we need to look at. It's called collective equity. That's where all the partners in the community, nonprofits, residents, uh, the, the government, and probably even the, the homeless come together to sign, find a solution that resolves everything for themselves. They should be, we should all not rely on all this stuff as the police, but as a community and as a government, totality of the, of the government to be able to handle these services. That's where we need to be. And as long as I'm the commander over there, I'm not just going down there and removing people just because they need to be removed or someone thinks they need to be removed. We gotta find a solution for them, period. That's all I have, any questions? Thank you. I just have a couple comments, and then I have some suggestions. One, I, I do appreciate the humanity of the homeless people. I do understand. I'm a health care provider. I, I do understand that this is a human issue, and I'm very, and like Kim said, we're very patient with that. I think our frustration comes from our feeling of being unsafe, and so yes, calling the police. I don't think the neighborhood has felt empowered like they felt like they have called over the years nothing's been done so they don't feel like it's important this may sound ridiculous but maybe the businesses out near there need to put signage up you see a crime call 862-6200 and we'll get the calls that you need so you can get the documentation but then we need to have the infrastructure of what to do with them like you're saying some of these people are criminal and i think we have to accept that they're criminal they may be being criminal for different reasons but then there needs to be a consequence. If I broke into someone's truck and stole $300 of supplies that they just bought from Lowe's, I'd be arrested and that I would have a consequence. And then there, beyond that, there needs to be the infrastructure of, yes, maybe they did it because they didn't have their medication. So then what happens next? So yes, housing is part of the problem, but I don't think that should be the whole focus. But when you are speaking about housing, maybe it could be something around these issues like, I would suggest maybe going and talking to Greenhouse Ministries up in Murfreesboro. They've done a really nice job of dealing mostly with vets, but they have a whole clustering of nonprofits that they've pulled together that address many of the issues of the homeless. And um, I, they're wonderful people. I'm sure they would be giving of their time to help kind of brainstorm some solutions that have worked for them, because I think that that's what, you know, that infrastructure needs to be a rolling infrastructure, not just the housing, but the criminal part, the consequence part, the health care part, and then the housing part is part of that as well. I, I disagree. The housing needs to come first because that's that what ends order. homelessness, and then you bring in the services that people need and the employment and all of that. I'm that's not saying exactly it's a, how I'm you're not saying support. it's in order. I think those things have to go in tandem. I don't think one I don't really think one is before the other. I think those are all the issues that we do need to address because as mm -hmm. residents we do feel unsafe out there. I do not shop in that area at all. I do not go to Walmart. I do not go to Lowe's. I don't go to any of those strip stores anymore. And I, that's used to be where I would do my shopping because it was convenient for me. And as I'm getting older and have less ability to drive, that's convenient, but I won't do that. If I have to take an Uber across town, that's what I would have to do. But, oh. and that's not, you know. I wanna follow up what the commander just said is like I would need to redirect the meeting. It's here to really brainstorm on solutions because we do know the issues. We hear, I hear from neighbors, we do know the issues and everything I've heard and, and it is real, but it's also real that the solution to homelessness is housing. It's simple, it's complex to do, it's, it's really difficult to do if there is no housing. And so I actually wanted to here from I just want to make one point. I, I really 
said that, you've kind of been talking for a while, and we're here to talk about food. I know, but it's, uh, and I share your beliefs, and I guess. It's not housing only. So That's not what I'm saying. Okay. But when you think about it, somebody's homeless because they don't have any housing by definition. Right, but they're exactly. I, that's where the services come in. But people who are in housing have mental health issues. People who are in housing have substance abuse issues. People who are in housing and in poverty are, are poor and have a hard time paying the rent and facing evictions. People who are evicted, not all of them end up being in homelessness. It's not, I, I just don't like dividing one group who is so out of luck and, and has, has experienced things and our systems has, have failed them because they made, some of them, they come up to me, they said, I made bad decisions. But all of us have made bad decisions. And not all of us, it's a very small percentage, ends up without housing. I wanna really hear from, because the purpose of this meeting was actually for the four of us to come together and discuss what next steps could be for us to talk solutions and then bring it to the community. But because there are three council members, it's a public meeting and it got a little hijacked, I feel. So I just really want to hear from. Gloria, Gloria did you want to go ahead? Can, can you hear me to the mic, or if I got it on? Okay. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say is, so part of, it, part of it is coming up with solutions to help, but I think another part is for the neighborhood to feel safe to know there are certain behaviors that are not acceptable. And, and, I, and I think it's, it's both sides. You know, one doesn't cancel the other, but providing opportunities and, and continuing, it's not a one-shot deal, it's gonna be an ongoing process forevermore, but also saying these things are not acceptable, period. If you have a mental health issue, it's still not acceptable. You know, If I drive down the road at 90 miles an hour, it's not acceptable whether I'm off my meds or not. It, it, it just isn't. And so I think part of what to get the buy-in with the community and our taxpayers, because money's going to have to go to this, is, is we need to know that both sides of that are being covered. And, and I, I'm not trying to, to minimize or anything else. It's just I think that's all part of the picture uh, is that we make sure and keep that as part of that well, conversation. The one so thing the I folks learned, don't feel we've ignored that. Yeah, the lear one thing I learned from Judy is, is I got a chance to talk to Judy for a while. Um, a couple weeks ago, and we had a good conversation. But the housing first really makes sense if it's going to be a sustainable solution. And I didn't really get that right away because realistically, if you just move them and help them on superficially, they're just going to gravitate back, right? So unless you can get them in one place and support them, it, it, we're just moving it around. And I think that's uh, Judy's point is it's not the only solution, but if it starts there, you can actually support them in, their fa in, in, in that way. And that made all the sense in the world is finding a place to take care of them or allow resources to be around them in some fashion. And then from there, you, you know, you can work around it. Otherwise, it, it's just like moving a herd of cats in a way. And, and, and the reality is they're all moving and they just come back versus a, full, a, a sustainable solution. And I think that's what I got from talking to Judy a little bit. And one of Yeah, we should look at models. That's great. And, you know, Judy doesn't have a lot of resources from what we're hearing, so. What, um, we, what we did, we leveraged resources in the community. That's kind of coordination. So in that encampment and in the larger encampments that I mentioned earlier, there is now mental health co-op is involved to go out and actually um, do telehealth and, and check on people and make sure they're connected with medication. Neighborhood Health is partnering with that. The Salvation Army is also providing some outreach with that. Uh, Lowe's is one of the focus areas. So they're already in rotation doing that. Um, neighborhood Health is also going out with um, doing some COVID testing there. So it's not like we're not focusing on getting services and mental health services and linking people to the medications or what they need. There is also a, there's going to be a special transportation system uh, through Neighborhood Health uh, because of COVID and at risk um, and also, I mean, those are things that are happening, and this is one of the encampments that is a high uh, focus area on that. And at the same time, yeah. I, I had a question on that $10 million. Is it possible to cross-use it to help 
set up a shelter, if, if it was a building someplace, would that be a, a purpose that would be allowed? It is allowed. Um, it is allowed. Um, the concept that I just talked to and I gave you the yeah. handout is what I would recommend because it's a smaller, more manageable, more quicker to housing. Because if you build shelters, if you build shelter beds, and um, if it's, again, too big, then people, again, may not want to come in. Uh, and we need to really fill the gap of the current shelter system. Like the <laughs> you explained really eloquently, there are certain, if somebody has um, some paranoia cannot be in crowds, they're automatically, they won't go to one of the larger shelters. Um, and if it's something that could be temporary, that's not even permanent, then it's not gonna be part of one neighborhood forever. It's for a specific purpose to get people to move in. The other thing we also need to think about, homelessness is all across Davidson County. So it's not a matter of, oh, we just shove them off to, from one council district to the next. It's really a matter of thinking of people are neighbors and you have neighbors in your neighborhood that, you, first of all, you don't like all the neighbors. You don't condone all the behavior of all the neighbors and you have crime uh, among people that are housed too. Uh, secondly, you have neighbors that are not in housing and they're just as diverse. And, and so I really, it, it is a resource man, matter, I think that these ESG, the, those emergency solutions grant dollars can be used for some of the shelters, but should be limited because if we fill shelter beds, we still don't have to pass to housing. So a lot of the investment, I would encourage nonprofits to apply for that rapid rehousing, which is an allowable model under it too. That, that would be perfect, you know, that, um, and um, she um, said, what about motels? So I actually talked to Clarksville well, is looking at purchasing a motel to uh, renovate and make kind of single apartments, smaller ones. Um, that is... Yes, please. Question. So, um, is your experience um, if there's a Yes. Uh, those are for medical respite, so they are on the higher end of being expensive, those particular ones. Yes. Yeah, they, but there are other options. It's like, okay, that you just triggered. For example, it doesn't need to be a motel. It doesn't need to be just a church, but if a church has a property and is willing to put up five tiny homes with AC and heat and have some basic facilities, that could be another location for temporary shelter and then working from there to permanent solutions, things like that. So those are the partnerships we need to look at. People um, will tend to be in a neighborhood, but also what we find, you cannot predict who's gonna wanna go into housing and not by just talking to them once or twice, because most people have also some pride and will tell you I'm fine. I've been out here for so long, but when you built the relationship, and, and then they go where the housing is. I mean, we've seen that too. So it's just, where are the places, how can we actually get neighbors involved with the ideas or helping, hey, here's a motel that will go out of business Maybe that could be an opportunity <laughs> to look at if they're 
Ferris dollars or something to purchase it. So if you have ideas like that, that would be mm -hmm. something to look at. Yeah, I, and I'm, I am not knowledgeable enough of this subject matter, so I need folks like yourself to, to bring information to me. What has been shown, and I, I hate statistics, but statistics can be helpful. Uh, if you have a homeless camp, would the majority of people, if housing available, accept it? Or do we find there's some certain percentage of hardcore that no matter what's available, it, it, they're just not going to? There are very few people that are not going to accept it over. They may not initially accept it because people feel, have probably gone through it already, then they didn't have the support and lost it again. So they may not want to. So there's this relationship building where you work with a person, where you help with budgeting, or there are situations, it, it, it's just at risk, or situations where an addiction is just so overwhelming that they fear they're just not there yet. So those are, I'm not saying that's not happening, but surprisingly there are studies where, I mean, most people will going to go into housing, they just don't know it's even available. And right now with the housing situation, they don't believe in housing anymore themselves. Well, and I think that's part of neighbors being fearful is not only what they see, but thinking we could do all these things and it wouldn't be accepted. So it's good to know that the majority of folks, if presented with options, would be And usually when we talk to somebody with about housing, None of us have a key to housing in our hands, <laughs> you know? So the conversation is going to be different um, if I actually have housing and I'm realistic talking rather than theoretical, <laughs> you know? Um, Judith, do you want to verify the balance sheet for me? Yes. So we have a partner. I'm going to start with we have actually the Homeless Impact Division has a partnership with MDHA to get up to 18 Section 8 vouchers a month for people and prioritize it for people experiencing homelessness. That program has been on hold due to lack of funding for months. So what they're basically the subsidy is not there. Then when there are vouchers out there, when we were the men they were given out, there are not enough landlords accepting the vouchers. So there may be, and I, I don't have the statistics in my head right now because it changes, but at times there was a third of the vouchers that are out there could not be used because there were no landlords. So one of the things for neighbors also as part of the solution would be, okay, can we help landlords? Because what, the other thing we found in COVID, landlords were more willing to take Section 8 vouchers because there's actually some payments coming with it. But it's like it's it's also a financial issue, but there are issues with that too. It's not, it's not sustainable. That's one time ten million dollars. We have probably two years to really come up with locally, and I'm not saying. I don't know where the money is coming from, but we have locally, it's if, if we actually built some a system, and when you think about it, here's how we flowed through the system, here's what we could do, and here's how many, going to the statistics, how many people we got actually off the streets into housing, how do we sustain that? I think we need the conversations to start now, how we come up with another five million a year after that, you know, to, my, to sustain my what is, we build. Is, uh, is taking a small building, I don't know where that would be, that you could connect or correct to that, uh, the needs at one time. And, and if that can convert, and we could use that to convert a building wherever that could be, to create an option, um, be a great use of that money. Uh, and if that's an option that we're allowed to use with under the rules, it may be a good starting point for us to try to figure out a way to do that. I, I, it, yeah, it's it's just repurposing a building if there could be an alternative. Um, the one question I, I had is how many uh, people are in this encampment? Do we know approximately? 40 to 50. 40 to 50, okay. It, it's the whole 
write that area by Charlotte, right? The one down there. Yeah, all of, and yeah. The one right along the river there? There, there are several, yes, but it includes all of them. Yeah. I've had, I just had somebody walk through again and. How, how often does a social worker or someone that does go down there to meet with them, how often does that happen, do you know? It's different groups. Um, there are at least, I know one group goes out twice a week. Twice a week. Okay. Another group uh, with the showers goes also out twice a week. So every day somebody is going to check in. So it, when they go, is there a point person or do they are able to get through everybody or how does that actually look? Uh, I, I do need to, so what I'm doing is sometimes get the calls together with the outreach providers and talk about it so I, they can coordinate and are more aware of what each other is doing. Sure. And, um, I th the way I understand it, most of it is in, in the parking lot at the front line. And then um, there are some that, because when um, people get used to the schedule, when somebody comes with meals, they come to the front. But we also have folks that go in and check on people, and that's that's twice a week, that one group um, does yeah, it twice a week. And then, then the question is... Uh, yeah, Councilman, yes, sir. One of the things, um, bear in mind that Judith has two people, Social services has some other people that uh, re outreach Troy and some different people we've worked with. But honestly, on a day-to-day -day basis, the people that probably have the best polls, the best idea are the advocates because they're there almost every day, different groups are, and they have the best feel for the number of people and the needs of those people. And the only reason I say that is if we're wanting solutions, um, the last time we went down there probably – a fourth of the people had MDHA vouchers that they couldn't use. And that would be something that I can't do anything about, but the council could. And when I say that to say, you can not, and I'm not blaming MDHA, I'm just saying if an emphasis was placed on MDHA to make use of those vouchers, and correct me if I'm wrong, that's gonna help a little bit right off the bat, because there's a lot of vouchers that have not been able to be used for years, because there just wasn't the, the apartments for them. Maybe with the economic uh, climate the way it is, it might be something where they'd be more willing to do it. Like, and that's one one idea. Another one is when you start looking at sp spending money. The one thing I would ask is for any of the homeless camps, more so than anything, we asked before, um, and it's expensive. But if you can get where the the medical popu you know, the medical capital of the world supposedly, and or at least for Nashville. If we could get all the different rehab facilities, there's about 45 to 50 within uh, 50 miles, if I'm not wrong. If they would all be willing to give up one bed a session, it would make a huge difference because you'll have a lot of people that when you go out and speak with them, they realize they've made bad mistakes. They realize they're in a tough spot and they'll want to get help. They're willing to, they'll tell you, hey, I'm willing to go through rehab, I'm willing, but there's no option for them. They don't have insurance. It's expensive. And to be quite frank, um, if you base on recovery court, drug court, drug court is the best example of what works successfully in rehab, and it's never been just 30 days. Nashville has their own facility, which is fantastic. Other counties do, but you get about that 80, 85 percent success rate. And what they do is it's very intensive, and it works with the person over a year, two years longer. And the advocates tell you, you can go down one time, and you're not going to help somebody. If you go down every day for a month, you're gonna make some inroads, but you still can't make a difference. What's gonna make a difference is if we can tap into resources where they can get addiction help, where they can get plugged into education and job placements. And a lot of that, we have some of those resources. They're just, I don't wanna say they're not utilized. They're just not functioning real well. The vouchers is the best example. That, that's one, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, the vouchers are out there, but nobody can use them. So that needs to be fixed, and that's not something any of us can. What'll happen, ma'am, is I'll talk to people, and I'll say, hey, what about house? And they'll say, hey, I've got a voucher. I just can't use it because nobody will accept it. So that Is that yes, because Councilman Rosenberg's point of yeah, it, less, less affordable yeah, and, housing? And, and, but there's different, that's a much broader problem that I don't even want to pretend to address. But as far as just the homeless, there's a, like you said, there's a lot of people down there that would be more than willing to move somewhere, jump into some work, jump into some rehab to try and get their life better. But it's just, it's not available in a way that makes it easy for them to use. 
So that's it. Thanks very much. And this, uh, just to tag on to that, if people are ready to go into certain programs and the beds aren't available right now, right there, or they're hard, you know, it's the opportunity is missed. Hey, what's up? Uh, my name is Edward. I don't know if I've gotten a chance to meet everyone here yet before. Uh, we're from Open Table. Um, we have, uh, is it six houses that are in Glencliff? Is it 12? Okay, yeah. Um, that was 2 million, um, and those aren't done yet. So it's definitely not fully sustainable with just a 10 million grant. I'm um, just updating everyone on that. Um, but I will say that, yeah, the way we have, like, our system right now as far as, like, um, bringing people out of homelessness, for, there's a lot of people who have been homeless for so long. The way we have things, it's actually impossible for them to ever really rejoin society in a way that they once were. Um, and that's, that's just a fact. There's people that like, can't ever go back because we've been doing this one thing for so long and it will require something really dramatic where we are like constantly nurturing them and, able, uh, and, and enabling them in like, the right way for them to ever rejoin society. And it will be a very long effort. You can't just have someone in a shelter for a few months or something like that. Do you think the drug court model, I, I got a chance to visit there and it's amazing program. I, I, it's amazing what they do with the success rate, is there a model there someplace with a group where you would take them into a, a very specific location? I mean, they got apartments, they learn job, you know, job skills and all that kind of stuff. Is there a similar model possibly available? I mean, it's just on the other side of the yeah. river in an old abandoned building that they converted. Yeah, so that, that's one of the things I'm talking about when I say like people can't rejoin is because like we will set things up that are like, let's have skills classes and teach people how to maintain a job, not just get one job. And we can have things like Section 8 and create vouchers for landlords. Landlords don't want them. People that have um, jobs don't want them because there isn't this like thing where they're able to like fully maintain themselves, fully have showers constantly, and like fully sustain one element of their lives because the other element just isn't there. And so that when we talk about like nurturing people and enabling them in this right way, it doesn't happen for long enough in, all, in an all-encompassing way. So having things like skills trainings is good, but it just isn't a part of the larger element. Does that, does that make sense? Because there's people a part of our, huh? How did you hear the last part? There's just so many elements in, that you have to engage at the same time for so long um, that it just like doesn't fully line up with the people. You have to retrain them to be functioning. What, what, what no, would, yeah, yes, 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 and no. But it, it's also not about them. It's about everyone else that has power. So I'm stepping away from the mic. I know I'm supposed to be talking into it. Um, so it, it is these landlords and it is these business owners who don't want to hire them and don't want to uh, be enabling them because it doesn't fit their profit motive, right? Because these people are risky. It does require like us to be able to take that risk to have them get a job with someone who uh, wants to. Uh, uh, employ them later. Does that if make you, sense? If you, if you had a million dollars, sounds like you're dealing with them. Oh, I wouldn't even be here. I'm kidding. Oh, no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> and you I'm could, kidding. I'm sorry, I can't. I it keeps getting free. in my mouth. <laughs> and you had anything to do, or you, you could spend it on anything that you think would change the equation. Yeah. What would you spend it on and what priority? Uh, I mean, I don't even know if a million dollars is really, no, uh, really But enough. I'm just proportional to, um, proportional to make a difference. Could be what I'm not even giving you an amount. I'm just trying to give you a sense of not a limited funds, but funds that you could actually do something with. How would you spend it, and what priority? Uh, this this is definitely a point where I kind of gotta say I am not talking as open table right now. I am speaking as Edward Kehoe sure. as an individual, and I personally am a firm believer in wealth redistribution because that gives people stability for a longer period of time, like I was talking about earlier. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. No, what he's saying Sorry. is a perfect example. Um, if you had a facility, and the reason I say drug court is because we all are familiar with it and it's successful in that sense, but you would also call it life court for lack of a better word, but it, you would have <laughs> to have an all-encompassing facility, what he's saying is, where people could slowly be brought back and along the way support. And that's a big part about drug court is they're constantly – there's a meeting, there's a lot of support, there's sponsors, but there's also some accountability with the, the drug test and things that you wouldn't have in a normal setting. But that's what it is. It's very, very intensive, and it's with that. They're not ever left alone. 
think that's kind of what he's saying is if you're going to invest in a facility to kind of help homeless and and to give to, to help them get back on their feet to rehab them, to whatever whatever words you want to use to get them back in the mainline society it's going to have to be all encompassing in that it's going to have to be where they can move in and they stay there for however long it takes until they're really ready to roll out on their own and you're going to have to have mental health you're going to have to have drink you're going to have to have a lot of of resources devoted to that. And I don't want to and, speak for y'all, but that's, yeah. if you're going to set up something, like I said, drug court is a great example of what's been set up. And you've also got a flip side is when they graduate from that, they've got to be able to have jobs to go to. They've got to have places to live. So it's a really large scale issue. I don't pretend to even. Yeah, that, I, Carl Reisner, I don't know if anybody knows him, but I was talking to Judy earlier. He's a friend of mine a long time ago. He passed away, but he, he built the A Street homeless shelter uh, where it used to be an old Sears building, and he had a whole progression. You, you came in, and I, I got to walk through it, and it's very impressive. Uh, not everybody made it, but the reality is you got an apartment for as long as you wanted, and from that apartment, there was furniture store at the bottom, and when you want to go out on your own, you actually did it, and there was job skills training. Not everybody made it. Clearly, there was a multitude of issues, but uh, very impressive. And, and it was to your point, some, it took up to two years for people to actually get through that program. And, and so if we're looking and beginning with the end of mind with some idea of real success, sustainability, what does that look like from people that really are around it? No, I mean, not that we have a lot of money, but the reality is, if, if we're going to solve this, it's going to take money. And, and so where do we go and what do we do to, to really figure out a better solution? Anyhow. Um, to answer your question directly, I have a few things I'd like to talk about, though. But spending the million dollars, million dollars doesn't go that far. But honestly, just building more housing. We just need more housing, bottom line. Any way we can do that, more housing. I really like what you said, Judy, about trying to get landlords to accept more vouchers. I don't have a great solution for that. We know that... There's property tied vouchers out there and there's programs set up where we will have a contract with the landlord and they will have this voucher for 15 or 30 years and that is guaranteed income every month for 15 to 30 years if they accept this voucher and that's still not enough incentive for landlords to accept this. Like that is mind boggling to me but it's more profitable for them to take the risk to see if they could get more income on those units than to accept these 15 and 30 year contracts from us. So that is really disheartening to me and I don't have a perfect solution of how to incentivize landlords more, um, but I just wanted to point that out. Also, um, we have this um, trend in Nashville where developers are coming in because there are no developer impact fees here in Davidson County, um, and that is something that needs to be changed at the state level, and I know that would be terribly difficult to do, but I feel like investing in some money to try to get these policy changes made is crucial. Um, I know in Williamson County, they do take um, impact development fees and they use them for their education system. Like I said, these are not easy things to do, but this is, these are things that need to be done. Um, and then also properties that do have vouchers, there's a database that HUD keeps across the country. Um, and this is a publicly accessible database and developers look at this database and it shows when the Section 8 contracts are going to expire and they are buying up these properties so that as soon as these vouchers expire or these contracts expire, they can demolish them and renovate them however they see fit. So having some sort of task force or body or entity that has an eye on this and is already communicating with these property uh, management companies or owners and say like, hey, this contract's going to expire, like what are your plans? Are you gonna sell? Just some keeping some sort of eye on these. Um, Cause yeah, that's a trend that unfortunately I don't think is going anywhere. It's just gonna keep getting worse here. Um, a couple other things that I wanted to bring up. So I'm with Open Table also, um, but yeah, I've been out into the encampments that are back on the side of town. Open Table doesn't have a presence there anymore. We have a West Side outreach worker. Um, her name's Susan, but there were so many other groups going back there. So she doesn't go back there anymore because there were already so many other groups going back there and giving them supplies and food and things like that. Um, also, our organization, along with a bunch of other organizations in town, keep track of the bodies that are found dead on the streets um, or are, um, yeah, are kind of like unclaimed and things like that um, to try to keep a track on how many people that are experiencing homelessness or recently were experiencing homelessness that are dying and we don't have these reports or um, bodies that are showing up of you know a bunch of people being dumped in the river or anything like that. 
And yeah, I've gone out and I tried to ID bodies and things like that too. So um, I wanted to bring that up. And then I also wanted to say that, so I'm in the MPH program at Vanderbilt and one of the professors I work with, her name's Dr. Mary Beth Shin and she's kind of an expert on homelessness and housing. And she did a study with HUD called the Housing Choice Options Study. And their study gave participants housing as soon as possible, um, help finding housing, and then housing with um, these wraparound services that we're talking about, you know, things like job training, um, mental health resources, basically like a caseworker um, to try to help them in any way possible. Um, and the outcome of that study was people weren't more likely to remain housed three years after they received housing if they had these wraparound services. The outcome of the study showed that we just need to get people housing as soon as possible, and they're more likely to remain housed even three years after the fact. Um, so I just think it's important when you're talking about this population, yes, there's a small portion of this population that does need a little bit extra help, but largely, this is a population that is self-sufficient, and they're victims of really broken systems. So I think that's just something also really important to keep in mind. I wanted to take up your question. Well, one of the things we talked about um, a best practice model term is permanent, su permanent supportive housing. So it's really, um, and uh, Metro is actually looking at that downtown permanent supportive housing building and, and um, just getting more units that have, are, are specialized and have, and prioritize people that are the most vulnerable. We don't need to shy away from prioritization and to really, you know, the most vulnerable get them the services they need, everybody needs help, but if we have limited resources, where do we as governments, as communities need to invest and start to invest? And that's the population we're talking right now. 1.2 million, it doesn't get us much with housing. Um, I looked around, we do not have, um, there is a model and for, I've been sitting here trying to, it's an ACT team model, it's a, um, outreach type model for people with severe and persistent mental health. It, um, 1.2 million will, it, it includes psychiatry, it's, like a, it, it's a team approach 24-7. Uh, it follows people from the streets into housing and ongoing supports. It's for really, uh, 1.2 million would assist 100 people, follow them, get them in housing, stay with them for as long as they need. It's really what we are talking about um, when we talk about people with severe per persistent mental illness, with drug abuse, with really that need that additional support. Very expensive, worth it, uh, because it's not, a majority won't need that intensive services, but that the people where we get the complaints in, where we everybody's stumped and we get the calls in, that's kind of the type of level of intensive services and it can start in the streets and then move into housing. Uh, the question is, has anybody uh, invited someone in the home to live with them that's a homeless person at their own home? Is that correct?
Can I respond? Or, oh, I'm sorry, you're not done yet. I'm sorry. Good thought. Yeah, good thought. Thank you. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just want, I want to, I'll be real quick. I'll let y'all do it. Um, I do agree with you on, on one element there, though, of how we can't really rely on the private sector to handle this issue because it is a public health issue. It's, it's a public issue, and us as the government and as people who care do need to be the ones that do step in. I do, I do agree with you on that element. But it is important to remember that, like, as unsafe as you may feel or as um, concerned for them as you may feel, um, they feel far more unsafe and they feel far more um, like their lives are in jeopardy more than yours is, I promise. Um, yeah, and, and as far as like letting people stay in your home, um, I'm definitely not against that. But the element I was talking about before though, when I was saying like our system in general doesn't help people who have already been homeless for X amount of time, people need to build up renter's history. They need to have good credit again before they can really reintegrate into society. And then just letting people like crash on your couch like definitely helps people immediately and maybe could be like a nice way to reintegrate them, but you know, there's it's, you can't rely on something like that. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Okay. They're, they're also citizens of this city as well. They're not just like random aliens who came here from another planet. Like they, they deserve all the rights that you have as well. Okay. I, I'm telling you. I think, I think. Well, I think we'll, um, I, I, I think the concern is, is, is real and, and it's, we're, our goal is to solve it. Um, it, it, huh? Helping, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but I mean, that's why we had this meeting, and we're serious about it. Is and try to intentionally come up with ideas, not just throw it, you know, to another five years. Uh, and and so, um, and, and the three council people and myself and Judy are hopefully going to come back with some ideas. If you want to be uh, on our email list just to keep it. Um, uh, and I'd like to get your study, if you don't mind, before I before you leave. Um, but Judy, when you, you want to wrap it up, because I think we got some great input. Um, I, I've been in business for a zillion years, a hundred years maybe. Um, and one thing I know, it, it, nothing's easy, uh, especially something as complex as this. And I don't know if I have any answers or anybody has any answers. We got some good people here. Um, I, but you know, we got to attack it somehow, and it's got to be a community uh, program. Um, I know our neighborhood uh, in that West Mead area, there's a lot of concern, but I had a lot of people raise hands said they would help. And I, you know, we aren't professionals. I don't know how we'll help, but the reality is getting people at least involved is a good starting point. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, ma'am. Act team. Uh, the the ACT team, um, assertive, can't remember the C. Uh, it's, it's a model, it's a mental health outreach model and actually following people into housing and it's the right support and in, most intensive support. I think it would give us the most money or, you know, it would give us the, 
a solid out, outcome for the most vulnerable people, um, probably for about 100 people. There are, and we do have the best practice models, and um, one of the things that's important is really to, you can have every best practice model and uh, know what to do when you don't have the finances, so we have to prioritize where the starting points are, and we have to include the communities, that the people that live in the areas to, to well, and, and be informed, know what's happening, and be part of the solution. And one of the things that, that we often see uh, are this little group's doing one part, and this little group's doing another, and it's not coordinated. And so you only get to this level because everybody's doing their own thing. And if it's coordinated, then we get all the people together and they continually meet with each other. So maybe your organization is great at one sector, and this organization has really got this down then rather than each of you trying to do everything, you kind of, and, and that means letting go of some ego. Because we're human beings and all human beings have ego and we love to have it being glorious, glorious plan, you know. But uh, if we take that away and say what's effective, not what has the ego involved, that's what I would love to see. And, and one of the things that, you know, you're the, you're the expert, so we look to you for everything and I know that's, that's a burden but you know, if, if we could figure out what are all the pieces, what are the organizations out there that if we brought them together, to not only today, but long term, how would we interact? And do those organizations need to come together every week or every month or, or how so that if I'm out there and I hear about something, I know how to plug that person into everything and there's not a lot of duplication. Uh, that, that would be one of my goals, is that we could somehow create a system that did have the highest activities at each sector, and there wasn't a lot of duplication, and, and the general public would know, the, this, is what, this is who I call, this is how I direct the person to get them started. About two years ago, and that's actually exactly what the Homeless Impact Division, most of us are working on, coordinated entry, and homeless management information system. Uh, I need to give, uh, I will send you an update. I do have to have a 2.30 call actually around one of the solutions <laughs> I'm working on. Um, but it's um, that's something I think I haven't, except for around the budget time, haven't communicated enough with all the council members and I'm probably, if you can help yeah. me how to best communicate what we're working on, what we've achieved and we are not where we need to be yet, but we're building towards that. And, and it I, would be, yeah. be really, you know, as, as this is an evolving plan, for us to be aware so we know how to plug people in. And then you can invite us to come to community meetings and talk about it. Right, I think right. we're at a point where I can better talk about it than I would have been able two years ago. Because so, I yeah. think there are many people in our city that would be willing to help, but they don't really know what to do. And we don't want them to put themselves or their families in danger trying to do something that maybe is not the appropriate way to go about it. I, uh, I, and when you're dealing with people who do have drug situations, you almost have to do the opposite of what your human nature tells you to do. Because if you do the thing that you think a good person would do, you've actually enabled them. And so you haven't helped them. I, I, I have to leave, too, in a minute. So, Council Rosenberg, I, Gloria, thank you, um, Council Lady. Uh, did you have any parting comments at all, sir? Yeah, thank you, thank, and thanks, Councilman, for getting this put together. Um, this has always been an attractive site, and it always will be. It's right off the interstate. It's the first thing you come to if you're traveling in from the west. It's adjacent to services, and it's private. Um, when we're trying to figure out, when we're trying to figure out how to move forward with COVID. I'm gonna listen to the scientists and medical experts and not my pal on YouTube. And I think this is one of the cases where we have to do the same, where we've got experts and we have, uh, thank you to Open Table, uh, MPD and, and uh, Judith Social Services for being here. Um, there's not an easy answer to it and it's not gonna get solved overnight. Um, it's gonna take resources from the community. It's gonna need to change mentality from the entire community as to how we approach 
budgeting, frankly, um, in Nashville and how we prioritize the, the dollars that we bring in. And um, it's, you know, I'm concerned that folks be safe when they're shopping over there. Um, I'm concerned that the folks who live there get the services they need to be able to live safe and productive lives. I'm a lot less concerned about whether there's an extra place to take a walk, um, but hopefully all those things work out well together. And, you know, I just thank everybody and for continuing to put their heads together and work towards a solution, because I think that we just need to keep trying until we just need to keep trying. Do you want to, I'd like to maybe, it, have an email where if there's continued questions, maybe go to the Judy and our council people, uh, only because I, I know I have to get back yeah. to my job. I just wanted to ask how often you plan on meeting about this or if there's gonna be additional meetings and how we can make sure we are aware of them um, and if there's any action items for us as community members, um, I'd either brainstorm or research and get back to you on. Um, yeah, and also if you could include the Homeless Planning Council in on these meetings, I know they've been left out of a lot of decisions the city's been making lately, um, and they're very frustrated about that. Sure. Uh, Judy, so, I, I let, let you yeah, lead us on um, that. I'm actually the staff for the Homelessness Planning Council. This was really intended just the four of us to meet, so this was kind of an ad hoc type of thing. Uh, and one of the things that we will discuss, this helped to actually get the input to different it's, it's not new ideas, we are aware of those, we know which ones are the best practice, but it's good to hear that actually the community thinks that way. And um, I think one of the next steps is for, for us to take the notes together, for me to follow up with everybody and then see, okay, when is actually, what is productive to bring people together? Who do we need to bring together around the audiences to actually move towards what do we prioritize as a next step? We can we know what needs to happen. We don't have the money to make it happen tomorrow. So how do we work towards that? And so I can't answer right now when the next follow-up is. It's really, I think, for us. The goal was for us to connect to actually get this moving forward and then have maybe even a bigger, um, you know, what the stakeholders are. And I do have to hop on a call. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to say, I can send you a list of all This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.com.